You're listening to Season 5 of Mobile Suit Breakdown, a weekly podcast covering the entirety of sci-fi mega-franchise Mobile Suit Gundam, for new fans, old fans, and not yet fans. We analyze all 42 years of Gundam, episode by episode and movie by movie, researching its influences, examining its themes, and discussing how each piece of the Gundam canon fits within the changing context in Japan and the world from 1979 to today. This is episode 5.4, Child and Soldier, and we are your hosts. I'm Tom, a lifelong Gundam fan, and unfortunately MSB will inevitably be cancelled when I'm just one episode away from becoming a podcast ace. Ah well. And I'm Nina, new to War in the Pocket and wondering why those two ruffians at the police station were so lovingly rendered. Seriously, the detail, the length of that shot. What's that about? Mobile Suit Breakdown is made possible by the support of 615 patrons and subscribers. Thank you all, and special thanks go out to our newest supporters. Major Kalashnikov, Pink Mobile Suits Are Bisexual Coding, and Ezekiel R. This podcast would not be possible without your support. Remember, folks, MSB has no ads or sponsors. We are entirely listener-supported. If you enjoy the podcast, consider subscribing to our Patreon or contributing to our Ko-fi. Patreon supporters, depending on tier, get early episodes, bonus content, access to an exclusive Discord, merch, and more. Links to all of the different ways to support the podcast are on our website, gundampodcast.com slash support. This week we are covering Poketo no Naka no Senso Episode 3, Niji no Hate ni wa, or War in the Pocket Episode 3, At the End of the Rainbow? Storyboards for this episode were handled by both Takamatsu Shinji and overall director Takeyama Fumihiko. Takamatsu was also the episode director for episode 1, and reprises that role here. The episode had two animation directors. One was Tomizawa Kazuo, who had worked on Tomino projects like Zambot and Daitarn, and served as animation director for four episodes of First Gundam. The other was Kawamoto Toshihiro, a key animator on Double Zeta and Char's Counterattack, who would return to do character designs on future Gundam projects 0083 and 8th MS Team. But perhaps his most impressive credit is as the character designer on Cowboy Bebop in 1998. Now, the recap. After a mad scramble to catch up to the truck and hang on, Al stands on the step at the back, musing about what might be inside and watching the street signs. Where are they going? But a sharp turn throws him off into the shrubs lining the sidewalk. He tries to get the local police to help him find the trucks, describing them in minute detail and even remembering the license plate number of one, but they ignore him until he claims they were involved in a hit and run and that his bruises and scrapes are the result. Two police officers drive him around the area until he spots the trucks, parked outside a warehouse. Inside, the Xeon squad stick to their story, but the police become suspicious and demand to see the cargo. Seeing the weapons surreptitiously prepped behind the backs of the soldiers, Al realizes that they're going to kill the police officers. He bursts into loud sobs as a distraction, and confesses to the police that it was all a lie. No truck hit him. He just recognized his brother, Bernie, driving and wanted help finding him. Once the police leave, Bernie scolds Al for the danger he put them all in and asks what he was thinking, and Al declares his desire to join the squadron. The captain humors him, presenting him with a badge in exchange for his silence and an explanation of the footage he took at the spaceport. Bernie drives Al home and stays nearby afterwards to keep an eye on him. That night, after Al's mother leaves for a community meeting, Chris catches Bernie trying to sneak into the Izuruha house. 
It's only after she's clobbered him over the head with a baseball bat that Al hears the commotion and rushes over, explaining that Bernie is his brother. By way of an apology, Chris's parents have Bernie and Al over for coffee and cookies. And as they make small talk, the boys continue the lie that Bernie is Al's brother, adding the embellishment that Bernie is Mr. Izuruja's child from a previous marriage. And that's why the boys meet in secret. The neighbors openly discuss Chris's work as a Federation data scientist, and Bernie is forced to think fast when Al blurts out that his brother is a real soldier. Just the reserves, I work in a factory now, he demurs, and takes Al away before he can say anything else dangerous or incriminating. In the morning, Al runs into his school friends on their way to the park, kitted out in pseudo-army gear and carrying airsoft guns. They invite him to come play war with them, but he calls back that he's busy and goes straight to the warehouse to watch the Xeon soldiers build the mobile suit they brought. At the same time, Chris goes into work, not as a data scientist, but as a test pilot on the Federation's new Alex mobile suit. Although the 360-degree view screen and magnetic coating are broader innovations, the speed and sensitivity of the Alex make it difficult for anyone but a new type to pilot it. They plan on sending it to White Base. On learning about the Federation presence in the colony, Captain Steiner tasks Bernie and Al with looking for a secret Federation base. Bernie takes the opportunity to lounge in the sun, but Al, with a map spread out in front of him and binoculars at the ready, takes their mission very seriously. When he recognizes a security guard at a large office park as one of the men working at the spaceport dock where the secret cargo came in, he's sure that office must be the secret base. With his knowledge of the colony's infrastructure, Al is able to lead Bernie through service tunnels until they are almost underneath the base, but the way is blocked by new doors that they can't seem to unlock. Finding the base is enough for Bernie, who is all set to return and fill in the rest of the squadron, but Al has other plans. He finds them spacesuits and a path to one of the small platforms on the exterior of the colony. By traveling outside, they should be able to bypass the doors. Al is clumsy in space, but they make it across. Once he's out of his spacesuit and before Bernie can stop him, Al scrambles down an air shaft, eventually coming out on a hallway next to the main warehouse. By standing on a crate between two vending machines, he can just reach his camera up to a high, narrow window and get footage of the Alex on the other side. But two Federation soldiers are coming down the hall. Will they spot him? Is there anywhere he can hide? We'll have to wait until next week to find out. While it's not necessarily stunning through the whole episode, this episode has a few moments of animation and of sound design and music that I thought were particularly beautifully done. And one of them is at the very beginning of the episode when Al grabs hold of the back of the truck and is sort of running and <laughs> scrambling and flying through the air. That is so beautifully animated. <laughs> it's so great. There's this balance of realistic anatomy but the way the body moves is cartoony <laughs> but just realistic enough mm -hmm. i love it one thing i like about this is the way al is running looks the way it feels to run flat out when you're a kid like that as a kid al's age i certainly was and i think most of us are pretty like awkward ungainly runners like our bodies are starting to develop at an accelerated pace and Many of us have never actually been taught how to run, so it's a lot of flat feet slapping the pavement, arms going every which way. When you're really going for it, it does have that feeling. When you grab hold of something that's moving faster than you are. <laughs> Flapping in the breeze like a flag once he manages to grab hold of this truck. Which uh, I definitely had happen with playground merry-go-round type equipment. <laughs> like if you try to get on it after it's already spinning. Uh-huh. Death traps. <laughs> 
and uh, thankfully manages to pull himself on and doesn't get too badly injured when he gets thrown off. He doesn't seem bothered by a few bruises and scrapes at all. No, not in the least. The moment he uh, notices the scrape on his arm, he's like, ah, <laughs> an opportunity. A plan begins to form. I thought the most standout impressive animation in the episode was the uh, musical montage when they're putting together the Xeon mobile suit, which hasn't been named yet, and so I will refrain from calling it by its name. I would have gotten there eventually, but yes, it is very beautifully done. We get some of that mobile suit eye candy. <laughs> I like that they have the music and some sound effects for the construction that they're doing. There's some like metal clanging kind of noises, but no dialogue. Even though we see people's mouths moving, we know they're talking while they work. No dialogue in that whole sequence. A lot of times those shots of like beautiful machinery are uh, incidental. They're in the background or we see them only for a couple of seconds. They don't get this kind of truly loving, focused attention. There were two other sequences that stood out to me. One is the simulation in the Alex, which gets named so we can call it its <laughs> name now. Uh, in particular, the change in orientation that happens very suddenly. And if you're a longtime listener, you know by now, I love that stuff. Put it <laughs> in my veins. Like anything that utilizes in an interesting way the fact that in space there's no real like up down orientation and you can change it however you like and for whatever reason which doubtless would be very useful in combat if you could wrap your head around it and uh props to chris as a pilot even though she's in a pseudo gravity environment she doesn't seem thrown or disoriented at all this alex scene is also a little bit of a call back to previous Gundams because they name these technologies, you know, oh, what do you think of the 360 degree view screen? What do you think of the magnetic coating? Mm -hmm. Oh, we think we're going to send it to that pilot on white base. The magnetic coating is a thing that was done for the original Gundam towards the end of first Gundam and the panoramic monitor was newly introduced in Zeta. So this Alex kind of bridges the gap between those two. This also like I was saying in a prior episode, helps us to figure out where this fits in the timeline of First Gundam. Because this is when Amuro is clearly starting to outgrow his Gundam. The Federation has identified him as a new type and that there are new types, and they've decided to construct a mobile suit specifically for new types. But unlike Xeon, who are out there building these psychic weapons like the Elmeth, the Federation's experience of new types is this guy, Amuro, who has unbelievably fast reaction time. And so what do they do? They create a mobile suit that is so finely tuned it reacts so quickly that only Amuro could use it properly. And with the expanded monitors, it gives him the ability to see and perceive more of the battlefield. I don't want to start talking about Chris too much because I'm sure we'll do that later, but one of the engineers she speaks to also comments on the sensitivity of the machine, and in the English subtitles, they translate his line as, oh, you'd have to be some kind of freak to be able to pilot this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the word he uses in Japanese is bakemono, which is often translated as monster. Yep. This is the first time we've had a Gundam series where there's no indication whatsoever that any of our main characters are new types. This is how the other side sees it. And the emergence of people like Amuro or Lala or even Char is unsettling and terrifying to old types. And then the final scene that had sound design and some animation as well that really stood out to me was when Al and Bernie are on the exterior of the colony briefly, and unless their helmets are touching, silence. <laughs> yeah, we can see their lips moving. There's a, even a great bit, pure comedy, when Bernie is trying to yell at Al, and Al just like moves his head away so that Bernie can't actually talk to him. And then the reflection of space in Al's helmet when Bernie holds him over the <laughs> railing. Oh, you're not afraid to die, huh? <laughs> uh, but that 
reflection with Al's face behind it, just really beautifully done. The facial expressions in general, I thought, were really compelling and conveyed a lot, although there are certainly some I'm going to want to talk to you about <laughs> where I uh, am not certain I understand the feelings behind it. But for the most part, the way the faces are done, especially in our three primary characters, is really impressive. Yeah, uh, I'm intrigued to hear which uh, expressions you want to explore further. I will point out, in 0080 so far, it seems like the faces of the characters are, let's just say, each animator is bringing a lot of their own unique style to the way they depict each character. There's enough of a through line that, of course, we recognize these characters. They're all sufficiently distinct from each other, but often they don't entirely look like themselves. This is particularly noticeable with Chris, I think. Depending on who's drawing her, she looks very different, which could be considered a problem, could be a knock on the quality of the animation, uh, a criticism of the animation director, but I kind of like it. I, I like seeing uh, each individual artist's own take on each of these characters. I mean, they all look good, even if each one looks different from the others. Well, with that, should we start talking about characters and what we learned about them in this episode? Sure. Starting with Al, you mentioned the bit where Bernie sort of holds him out over the uh, expanse of space to terrify Al a little bit. And there is definitely some terror. He's flailing around. But there's also a sense of wonderment there that grows as the fear fades, which feels very Camille to me. Reminds me of the way Camille looked at space in those early episodes. For me, the through line for Al in this episode seemed to be how he's caught in between childhood and adulthood. Hmm. Because there are so many things that happen in this episode, things that he does, things about how he's drawn and how he's acted that convey childishness. And yet at the same time, this is really the first episode where we've been shown Al's potential. And that wonderment feels to me like another moment of childishness. Just like every time that he taunts Bernie or makes faces at Bernie... <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I realized this episode, they have always shown us Al in shorts. And his other friends who are the same age sometimes wear long pants. They don't all wear shorts all the time. The shorts are a marker of being a boy. Mm -hmm. Like changing to long pants is a whole thing in a bunch of cultures. So he's got this visual marker. He's impulsive. He, like, thinks through plans for one step, <laughs> but not beyond that. He's, You're thinking about him going to the police? Right. He thinks, ah, well, I know the license plate number so the police can find the truck and that will help me find them. He completely does not consider what will happen to Bernie if the police believe him. Or once he gets there, the danger that he's put these soldiers and the police and himself in until he sees Misha's gun. For a kid who's obsessed with war, he has a very difficult time understanding interpersonal conflicts or even factional ones. There's a certain, and I'm sure this is because he has grown up in a peaceful colony and he just kind of expects everybody to get along. He doesn't realize when he's leading the police to the Xeon soldiers the, what will probably happen as a result of that. He doesn't realize when he's telling these tall tales about how Bernie is actually his brother and how they have different mothers but the same dad, doesn't entirely realize the kind of chaos that that could cause if it were to be, say, relayed to his mother. That's another impulsive moment when he blurts out, oh, my brother's a soldier too. Bernie's a real soldier. This is one of the first times we see him try to tell the truth to an adult. <laughs> and it doesn't work. And so suddenly we have a lot more understanding for why he lies so consistently. Mm -hmm. Because if nobody's going to believe you when you tell the truth and nobody's going to listen to you, then really what's the point? Yeah. A few episodes back, you pointed out that Al is always telling adults what they want to hear. But in this episode, he's telling adults what they expect to hear. 
which isn't quite the same thing. And it's not the first thing he tries, right? He tries the truth <laughs> first. <Yeah. laughs> when he, he goes to the police and he just asks them to trace these license plates. He doesn't say why. He oh, I thought he did. Only after they don't believe him. Maybe it's not explicitly stated. My interpretation of that scene was that he told them, oh, there's Zeon soldiers on the colony and they came in on these trucks. He definitely then, doesn't say that in the dialogue. Right. But we kind of enter that scene in media rest when he's already started talking to a police officer. So my read of it was that he had already mentioned who these men are and that we're at the part now where he says, and they're in these trucks. And then here is a very detailed description of the trucks and the license plate number. And I'm sure you guys can find them. <laughs> See, I don't think he would do that because of the promise he made to Bernie about the Zaku. But if he doesn't give a reason, then why on earth would he expect the police to care or to help him find some random trucks for no reason? Well, because he's 11. <laughs> I mean, they clearly don't care. And I feel like if he said, I saw some Xeon soldiers infiltrating the colony, that might get some attention, even if they don't entirely believe him. Now, certainly the hit and run is a more believable story, and it's the one that gets the police attention, because at that point he is speaking their language. He is talking to them about things that are relevant to them and that they expect to hear. He has fit into their schema for the sorts of people who come into the police station and ask them to do things. He also reveals in this scene and once they're actually at the warehouse that he kind of understands the status that children have in society and that he can use that to manipulate adults. He knows they'll want to protect him if someone hurt him, even if they aren't listening to him in general. He knows in the warehouse that the minute he starts crying loudly, he will pull all attention to him and distract from whatever was going on. And that the explanation that he just, like, lied about all of this will be believed. It's not what that police officer wants to hear in that moment. Nobody wants to learn that they've been... <laughs> Wasting their time. Manipulated by an 11-year-old boy. But uh, nonetheless, it is kind of what they expect to hear from a kid. In a similar vein of things not being entirely thought out, He's very disappointed to learn that they don't plan to fight in the colony. What? Who exactly does he think they should be fighting and why? Al thinks that fighting with guns is the job of real soldiers. I mean, that's pretty clear when he's talking to Chris and her parents after she clobbers Bernie. And uh, <laughs> the captain looks kind of angry when Al says this. And I wasn't sure if it was because... This 11-year-old is kind of calling him a coward or because he fundamentally agrees with Al and thinks they should be attacking the colony, but he has orders not to. I don't know. I didn't get that read from his uh, expression in that moment. Either one of those could be possible. I think he might be surprised to hear Al say that he wants there to be more fighting in the colony. I'm not entirely certain that it's true when he says it's only for their escape. Because for what it's worth, a single mobile suit is not a particularly good way for four people to escape a colony. On the Al's potential side, this kid has a ridiculous visual memory. Oh yeah, when he remembers the face of that guy? Well, he remembers the face of that guy he saw once, days ago. He can describe these trucks in pretty substantial detail. He remembers the license plate number. He's methodical when they're looking for the secret Federation base. He's got his map out and his binoculars, and he's looking for Federation license plates. He's very focused. He has a plan mm -hmm. and a method, and he's going to work through all of it. And even when Bernie is like, oh, let's just go get lunch. He's like, no, give me a few more minutes. <laughs> like, he's very focused. He's clearly a very smart kid when something interests him. He has this really good understanding of how the infrastructure of the colony works. Like he knows if you're in X hangar in the spaceport, then you're probably going to use this elevator and it's going to take you down into this part of the colony. And then he knows once they're in the sort of maintenance tunnels, 
which was his idea in the first place. He knows where the spacesuits are stored. He knows how to do the spacewalk from one section to another. Yeah, he's got a lot of knowledge of this place and is pretty clever about coming up with plans to accomplish his personal objectives. When I was in middle school, my class went on a field trip to the local water treatment plant to learn about the infrastructure of how the drinking water supply worked in our small town. Uh, and I remember that that happened, but I didn't pay much attention to it. It wasn't interesting to me. But Al is the kind of kid who would have memorized everything about that plant while he was there. The final thing that I want to say about Al, and it winds up connecting to the other characters, but in his probably impulsive lie that Bernie is his brother is a kind of wish fulfillment. Mm hmm. And in his desire to join this Xeon squadron, is he, to some degree, trying to create a replacement family? It's a natural fit for it. I mean, Steiner is presented when he is talking to Al, when he sort of gets down uh, into a crouch to talk to him directly and is like, I want to ask you some questions about what you saw. He's playing the role of the kindly grandfather. It's a role. There's probably some truth to it, but he's definitely acting for Al's benefit, but he is creating this dynamic. Bernie is the older brother. Misha and Garcia are the... Uh... Scary uncles? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, I... scary, yes, but never to Al. Not to his face. Even if Garcia does think they should have killed him. It is, of course, impossible to know what is going on in Steiner's head. It does seem as though Steiner's reasons for not killing or kidnapping Al are practical rather than moral. Oh, yeah, definitely. That a, an investigation of a missing child or a murdered and discovered child would be much worse for them than the risk that the kid will maybe tell someone something. Right. I mean, they were going to kill those cops, yeah. right? They were ready to do that. That would have been a significant setback for their plan, probably, but they were prepared to do it. You know, the moment Al starts crying, we see Steiner turn away from the rest of the group, heading towards the door and reaching for something under his jacket. So presumably he's going to go and take care of the partner at the car mm -hmm. while Misha deals with the guy actually in the warehouse. Yeah, I didn't necessarily think family in terms of each of these men in the squadron fulfilling a specific familial role, but in that sense of belonging and mm -hmm. mutual care. Yeah, I mean, when Steiner talks to Al and enrolls him in the unit and gives him the patch uh, with the James Bond spy radio in it, he's giving Al exactly what Al wants. He gets praised, he gets included, he gets to be relied upon. I'm glad you brought up how Steiner treats Al because it forms this very interesting contrast with how Bernie treats Al. Because always in the back of our minds when Steiner is doing all of this is this sense that he is humoring this little boy and he is manipulating <laughs> this boy so as to protect the mission and protect the squadron. But when Bernie treats Al like a little brother, it doesn't feel like a manipulation. It feels like he legitimately feels an attachment to this kid, feels a bond of some kind, wishes he had a little brother or misses his own little brother or... Bernie is feeling the same loneliness that Al is feeling. I think this episode, the whole show, but this episode really does a lot to set up Bernie and Al as comparable characters, as parallels of each other. Bernie is lonely. And Bernie so desperately cares what Al thinks about him. This is the origin of that lie about how he was just one kill away from being an ace. Which, of course, uh, in a painfully embarrassing scene later, all the other Cyclops team guys hear about and rib him. Not too unkindly, but God, you can feel Bernie's embarrassment in that moment. Even though Al takes several opportunities to taunt Bernie, his adoration for Bernie is so clear. Just his facial expression when they're riding in the car together, the wide eyes, the soft smile, and the fact that he then brags about or wants to brag about Bernie to anyone who will listen to him. 
and advocate mm-hmm. for him like oh why don't you let him be the pilot he's a great pilot he would be like uh-huh. he doesn't know but this guy is his surrogate brother and so yeah. he's going to talk him up to everybody his idol and his hero and i think part of that is that bernie fits a mold for a storybook war hero he's young he's handsome he's kind And so he's a good sort of movie star version of a war hero. Al does not idolize actual aces, Misha or Garcia. What's funny about all of that, though, well, a couple of things. Bernie tries to be extremely honest with Al about the horrors of war. He's blunt about it. Dying in space is like hell. Globules of your blood float around in the cockpit of your mobile suit as you die. I've seen many of my friends die. None of this quite sinks in for Al, uh, but he does try to convey that. I also have this sneaking suspicion that Bernie would be perfectly happy never to pilot a mobile suit again. Yes, Uh, definitely. (laughs) Because every time Al brings it up, he grimaces, even when they're alone, even when it's not embarrassment over this lie about being close to being an ace. And while I (laughs) feel total understanding for that position, Al would probably consider that cowardice. Definitely. Al would accuse Bernie of being a coward if he knew how Bernie really felt. And that would be crushing for Bernie, because again, Bernie really cares what Al thinks about him. In that scene in the car, when Bernie is talking about the psychological difficulty of facing an opponent in combat, about the necessity of killing before you get killed yourself, he's grappling with the way he understands war. And in Al's idolization of him, he sees a more innocent, more pure version of himself, a different attitude about war, about killing, which is uh, seductive in how easy it is. How pleasant. The way Bernie scolds Al feels just like an older brother. When he picks Al up and puts Al on his shoulders, he didn't have to do that to sell the ruse. They could have just walked away. That was just him being fun and Mm -hmm. affectionate. And uh, Steiner and the squad kind of treat them the same way, treat them like brothers in that they'll keep each other busy and out of our hair. The attitude is that Bernie and Al are both more liability than asset. You think that's why they make the crack about watching Al will keep Bernie out of their hair? Yeah. They don't know or trust this guy, and the only two things he's done so far are successfully pilot the shuttle, which, you know, good on him, but also draw the attention of this kid, get the cops interested in them, and nearly blow the whole mission. Yup. Speaking of, why does Bernie try to sneak in to Al's house? The mom just (laughs) left. Go up to the front door. I mean, good question. It's probably just necessary to get that scene of Chris clobbering him. Or doesn't realize that oftentimes the best cover is just acting like you're supposed to be a place. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, which, before we move on to talking about Chris... Uh, The phrase playing a war gets used twice in this episode. The first is Bernie scolding Al when Al says he wants to join them. He says, we're not playing here. And then when Al's friends show up to invite him to go play in the park and he says, oh, I'm busy today. And they've got dog tags and helmets and bags and airsoft guns. And sensible eye protection. Yes, absolutely. But that the uh, the real soldiers are in disguise, being subtle, hiding out, and the playing at soldiers are kitted out in pseudo-military gear. And even Chris is a real soldier in disguise here. She acknowledges that she works for the Federation forces, but she says, oh, I'm, I just do data entry. That just makes me think she's a spy. The way, <laughs> the way that she said that was like, oh, so you're a spy. Got it. No, she's a test pilot. But the data she enters is about how awesome she is at piloting the Alex. I want to talk again about playing war, and especially about that scene with Al and his friends, Che and Telcott. Because in that scene with Chris's family, Chris makes a distinction between what she does and fighting with guns. And then when we see Al's friends going off to play in the park, they're very clearly holding huge, oversized airsoft guns, 
seem to be replicas of real guns, I think. So there's, there's a sense, again, of the real and the play mixing and conflicting as different ideas of what war is cross each other in the stream. I also really like that in that scene, when his friends are all kitted out and they're like tactical airsoft gear, <laughs> Al's got his Cyclops team patch on his sweater. He is also dressed up to go and play war, but his version of playing war is the real thing. And his sweater has an old airplane design on it. Hmm. I don't know if you noticed. No, there's, I didn't. There's a little plane on his sweater, which again feels very childish. A lot of kids' clothes have cool machines on them. <laughs> yeah. I do want to point out while we're here, I think that bit of Steiner giving him the patch is in the opening when the song is playing and they show a poster that just says award and it's a hand holding out a medal. Mm. I think that's the connection there. Mm -hmm. I will say you've called them Cyclops Squad. Cyclops team several times now. I don't think that's ever been mentioned in the show, though I do appreciate knowing who they are. Oops. <laughs> well, I mean, in this episode, you see their emblem and it's a C and then like a dot and then the Xeon wing. So like clearly the C and the, the single dot is the I. So really anybody could have figured out that they're called Cyclops, right? This is why everybody hates Gundam fans. <laughs> Ah, uh, I'm just trying to defend myself from accusations of spoilers. This pressure. It feels as though dozens of Gundam fans are rushing to their computers to remind me that actually the name of the Cyclops team was said at the beginning of the first episode. Seriously? Whew. I sure am glad I had that new type flash there and didn't publish an early access version of this episode without the correction. Can you even imagine? So embarrassing for me personally. It can be legitimately tricky talking about some of this stuff without at least spoiling the names because you have to be that squadron, <laughs> the kid with the red hair. <laughs> Speaking of names. Yeah, you mentioned it was Che and... Telcott. Okay, we hadn't heard his name yet. That's, yeah. It, okay, okay, but that one, that one is in the credits. <laughs> Speaking of names. The Alex is a fun pun because it comes from RX, ah, as in RX 78 2. RX. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. And did you notice both the, um, the Alex's shoulder and Christine's pilot suit have a four on them? And that's because, leaving out some uh, MSV stuff and some stuff from video games and manga that will come later, this is the fourth Gundam unit. Got it. Cool. In uh, perhaps a good segue to your next topic, the degree to which Chris's family are very upfront with the stranger about the fact that she joined the Federation forces potentially reveals a lot about this neutral colony's position vis-a-vis mm -hmm. <laughs> -vis the two sides in this conflict. And then the fact that Bernie is very quick to cover up his having been a soldier uh, <laughs> before Al can say anything else that would potentially be damaging or dangerous. Yeah. Given what we're told in this episode about the Alex, its design, the new technology incorporated and its intended use, plus what we've been able to figure out in prior episodes about the timeline and all of this taking place in mid-December, UC-79, this has to be happening around when the white base was visiting side six. So side six is still neutral, theoretically, and Bernie confirms that for us when he says that the security treaty is not yet in effect, but clearly they're moving in a Federation word direction. Even the contrast between how the white base and its crew are treated when they arrive in side six in first Gundam with the like tape over all their weapons and all these strict rules and strict surveillance of them while they're there. And I believe there are Xeon soldiers there too, right? Or mm -hmm. like it's not just one or the other. Both can come and go and are being held to these very strict rules versus here where it's like an open secret that the Federation is all over the place and that there's this Federation base or facility and 
where a Xeon soldier would maybe not want people to know that. Yeah, at the end of the side six episodes in First Gundam, there's a little bit that really stuck with me because there's like a TV news spaceship that is broadcasting the white base's battle against the Konskan assault force. And the commentary feels at least somewhat pro-Federation, pro-white base. And it ends with this line of one of the newscasters saying, you know, our nation must seriously consider how to respond to these events and what our relationship should be with these two belligerents. And at the time, that felt appropriate and organic for the situation. With this context, it sort of retroactively begins to seem like an attempt to manufacture consent mm. after the government has already decided <laughs> that they're going to side with the Federation, but perhaps before the security treaty has been publicly announced or finalized. Of course, the security treaty between the Federation and Side 6 feels like a fairly transparent allegory for the security treaty between the United States and Japan. One of the key features of which, of course, is that it allows the U.S. to maintain quite a lot of bases in Japan, very much like the Federation bases in Side 6. I talked earlier about the parallels between Al and Bernie. I think at the same time, the show also wants us to see parallels between Bernie and Chris. Both of them are pilots and soldiers, young, around the same age. Both of them have a kind of pseudo-older sibling relationship to Al. Chris actually is a figure from Al's past. She's been gone for years, but they were neighbors and friends before that. And Bernie is pretending to be that. Bernie is pretending most of the time not to be a soldier, just like Chris. Although with Al, Bernie is hyping himself up to be a better and more accomplished pilot than he actually is, whereas Chris is spending all of the time pretending to be a much less accomplished pilot than she is. Kind of sexist, but for a young boy like Al, Chris doesn't need to impress Al. A young boy doesn't look to his older sister to be inspired mm -hmm. or for someone to admire. He looks to an older sister to be taken care of and coddled and spoiled and <laughs> occasionally scolded, uh, but to fulfill like a mother light role. Mm -hmm. Whereas an older brother, you want to look up to, you want to admire, you want to be proud of. Yeah. And that those feelings can go both ways. She doesn't feel compelled <laughs> to be exciting, interesting, admirable soldier. Yeah, it, it is an open question if Chris actually told Al that she is a pilot and piloting the latest, most advanced mobile suit ever made, would he react to her the way he reacts to Bernie? Probably not. He probably would not see her as someone to model himself on. He might even actually worry about her safety. <laughs> After all, he falls so quickly into that no girls allowed line when he's sneaking out to go hang out in the Zaku. And at the same time that Bernie and Chris are being compared and contrasted to each other, the Alex and this new mysterious Xeon mobile suit, which I'm being very careful not to name yet, are compared to each other as well. The scene of Chris in the Alex cockpit running through simulations as the Alex sits in pieces, unassembled, directly precedes the scene of the uh, Xeon team putting together their mobile suit. The scene where we learn that Chris is the pilot of this Gundam, or at least the test pilot for now until it goes to the white base, directly precedes the scene in which Steiner says that Misha has been chosen as their pilot. This is all doing necessary work to set up conflicts and clashes that are going to happen in the remaining episodes. And that's not a spoiler, that's just how narrative works. And now Tom's research on the visuals in the title sequence. When the opening song, Itsuka Sora ni Todoite, written, composed, and performed by Hokkaido-born pop idol Shina Megumi, just two years on from her debut, starts playing, we see a curious mural. The first thing we see is two faces looking down at an early aircraft. As the camera pans to the left, we see a third, a woman reclining in a feathered mask. 
It's hard to guess who the people might be, though they're drawn realistically enough that I assume they are based on some real people. That plane is another matter. It is very clearly the Aerial Steam Carriage, a single-winged aircraft designed and patented in 1842 by early aviation luminaries William Samuel Henson and John Stringfellow. Now this was some 60 years before the Wright brothers and their rivals around the world would achieve powered, controlled flight, so you don't need me to tell you that the aerial steam carriage never actually flew. But it was an ambitious design, meant to carry as many as 12 passengers at the blistering speed of 50 miles per hour. Lift would come from a single monoplane wing, 150 feet or 46 meters in length. The passengers would be housed in a carriage beneath the wing that looked a bit like an inverted clothes iron, and stability would be aided by a distinctive fan-shaped tail. Propulsion then would come from a pair of large propellers driven by a lightweight steam engine. Unfortunately, the proposed engine was woefully underpowered for the craft. They would never build the airplane of their dreams, but what they did do was launch a major publicity campaign commissioning paintings and sketches showing their flying carriage in distant and exciting locales around the world. The advertising campaign, like the plane itself, failed at its actual goal, which was to convince investors to fund the project, but it did stoke imaginations, and it left a lasting artistic impression. A few years later, Stringfellow would revise the designs and create a smaller, unmanned experimental model only one fifteenth the size of the aerial steam carriage. That model would fly, at least a little bit, and it proved to be a noteworthy step on the bumpy road toward true powered flight. After the flying carriage, the opening continues, and we see a pair of freestanding arches, possibly triumphal ones, but with no details that would allow us to identify them further. Then there's a sailing ship with a prominent forecastle and aft castle, a carrack, these were the state-of-the-art seagoing vessels of the 15th and 16th centuries, used for exploration, trade, and conquest. There is a good chance that this carrack is meant to be the Santa Maria, the lead ship in Christopher Columbus's first expedition to the Americas, and arguably history's most famous carrack. Or it could represent the Portuguese carracks that brought the matchlock arquebus to Japan in the 16th century. Next, we see some animals. Unlike the other images that preceded them, there's no sense of realistic anatomy to be found here. In their shapes, the use of subtle shades of the same color, and the way they overlap with each other, I am reminded of nothing so much as Picasso's 1937 painting, Guernica. If that was the inspiration, it would make a lot of sense within the overall story that is being told throughout this sequence. Guernica depicts, in a surreal and horrifying way, the bombing of the Basque town Guernica during the Spanish Civil War. The bombing was requested by Francisco Franco and his nationalist faction, and carried out by his allies in Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. It was among the first aerial bombardments, and one of the first to directly target civilians. Like Al's Side 6 colony, Guernica had not been directly involved in the fighting up to that point and it had no meaningful anti-air defenses. The operation was codenamed Rügen, a name that might be referenced in the name of a Xeon officer who shows up later in War in the Pocket. We can read these parts of the opening, perhaps, as a story about how the human quest for knowledge and discovery is wedded to our darkest impulses. Less than a hundred years after Henson and Stringfellow imagined the aerial steam carriage carrying tourists off to see the pyramids, fascists were using airplanes to bomb civilian towns. In the Carrack we see how exploration went hand in hand with empire, exchange with exploitation. This is largely the same story at the heart of the movie Royal Space Force, which came out two years prior. At one point, the movie gives us a similar series of abstract images – animals, children's drawings, cave paintings, and murals – in a kind of rapid-fire summary of history. It shows how the same metallurgy that created farm implements produced the sword. An early astronomer, peering into his telescope to plot the stars, 
morphs into a scene of naval warfare. An early glider gives way to a steam engine, race car, fighter plane, turbine, jet plane, mushroom cloud. I've noted previously that many in the staff for 0080 worked on Royal Space Force, including the screenwriter Yamaga and a number of the animators. Among them was Kubo Oka, who is credited as one of the four animators who worked on this title sequence. I think it is at least plausible that the same people were trying to get at the same idea again. After this initial pan ends, we are treated to a series of four still images, washed out like old photos. Some kids in a small boat, a pile of blocks with English letters on some and pictures on others, then an old toy robot, and finally a tricycle. It's beyond me to identify all of these, but when I saw that robot, I knew I had to talk about it, because I recognized that toy robot immediately. It is an exact reproduction of the late 40s Japanese-made tin toy robot known as Atomic Robot Man. I hope those of you listening to this Gundam podcast are interested in toy robots from Japan, because I want to talk about the history of them before I get to Atomic Robot Man himself. And, as it turns out, the story of toy robots has always been the story of childhood wonder crashing headlong into the brutal reality of nation, empire, power, and exploitation. Long before Gundam, and in fact even before the Second World War, Japan had already established itself as a powerhouse toy maker within the global economy. Starting around 1915, while their European competitors were occupied with the First World War, Japan exported huge numbers of cheap but high-quality toys. Among them were porcelain dolls, celluloid figures, and, eventually, tin robots. It's easy to see these as another era's version of the Japanese-made dolls, models, action figures, and statuettes that suffuse today's nerdy consumption culture. By the 1930s, U.S. toy manufacturers were begging the government to do something to staunch the flood of inexpensive Japanese toys. But World War II put an end to all of that. Even before the United States entered the war, the militarists running Japan's economy had already shifted to a total war footing. In 1938, a year into the Second Sino-Japanese War and three years before the Pearl Harbor attack, the government prohibited the manufacture of metal toys. This was part of a broad ban on indulgences of all kinds. Working beneath posters that declared, luxury is the enemy, the toy makers retooled their workshops to make bomb components instead. As the war increasingly turned against them and shortages of raw materials grew worse, the government began confiscating anything metal they could find. Pots and pans, cast iron stoves, statues and bells from temples. By 1943, they needed raw steel more than they needed bomb components, so they took the molds themselves away from the toy makers and melted them down. Then, in 1945, the U.S. bombers arrived. The artisan districts, all of those workshops, were prime targets. But back in 1935, that disastrous future must have been unimaginable. That was the year when the very first known toy robot was manufactured. It was called Lilliput, like the island from Gulliver's Travels. Lilliput is a boxy, old-timey looking robot with painted dials and shiny silver claws. It was designed in Japan, but the first toy robot in history was manufactured in Manchukuo, the Japanese-dominated and colonized puppet state northwest of Korea. Toy robots and empire going hand in shiny metal hand. Exploitation in one place to create things to delight children somewhere far away. But while Lilliput looks a bit like the robot from 0080's title sequence, it is not quite the same. To find THE robot toy, we have to look after the war. When the US began occupying Japan, the country's economy was in shambles. The total war economy had hollowed out whole sectors of industry, and the U.S. bombing campaign had devastated what infrastructure remained and killed countless artisans. There were no raw materials to work with, no tools to work them, no money to buy the finished products. The surviving toy makers would return to their trade, 
but they would do it by hand or with improvised wooden molds. The tin they used came from cans salvaged from the trash, discarded outside the many American army bases. By 1947, the occupation authorities identified the toy makers, rising Phoenix-like from the literal ashes of their pre-war industry, as one of the few sectors of the economy that could produce goods for export. So, cheap Japanese toys, now stamped Made in Occupied Japan, returned to the American market. And, somewhat ironically, the most successful of these were recreations of the very same weapons of American military might that had crushed Japan just a few years prior. Toy jeeps, toy tanks, and, darkest of all, toy B-29 bombers. They were a hit at Christmas. Yet among these toys was something more fantastical, a wind-up clockwork toy robot, a clear successor to the design lineage of old Lilliput. Gray instead of yellow, but with bright red feet, a little more squat with shorter arms and legs and a bit more rounded in body and head than Lilliput, with ears that stick out, a red lever in its chest beneath the decorative dials, and something like a hat molded onto the head. It is a perfect match for the robot from the 0080 title sequence. It is believed to be the second toy robot in history. This little robot was stamped Made in Occupied Japan and given various names in the U.S. market. Atomic Man, Robot Man, and, as it's known today, Atomic Robot Man. It appeared in U.S. advertisements at least as early as 1949, alongside other wind-up toys, like a realistically crawling soldier or a furry poodle that could sit up and beg. One ad described it thus, Although our Atomic Man looks like a character from Mars, actually he's only a toy. Only a toy that will transport any child in the land into sheer delight. The bolt through his head, the rivets and dials lithographed on his body combine to give him an out-of-this-world look. And when you've wound him up and pressed the start lever on his tummy, he lumbers along like Frankenstein's monster, with his arms swinging at his sides. An imported metal toy he'll last a long time, too. Each, 85 cents. Other advertisements offered the toy for wholesale, with prices as low as $3 for a dozen or $32 for a gross. And though only about 13 or 14 centimeters tall, roughly the height of a high-grade Gunpla model, the box for Atomic Robot Man featured an artist's rendition of the robot on a colossal scale, stomping down a city street and towering over the buildings on either side. Some of these Atomic Robot Men remained in Japan. Manufactured at the end of the 40s and into the early 50s, it's easy to imagine them firing the imaginations of the same artists who would then create the groundbreaking mecha manga of the mid-50s. You can draw a line straight from Atomic Robot Man to the nuclear-powered mobile suits of Gundam. It turns out that the first two toy robots in history were both manufactured in occupied territory and sent to delight the children of the occupier. Lilliput in Manchukuo and Atomic Robot Man in occupied Japan a decade later. They were cheap because they were made where the labor was cheap, and the labor was cheap in part because of the wars and the desperate power imbalance that existed between the nations. Ironic, then, that the earliest giant robot manga and eventually the first giant robot anime, Yokoyama Mitsuteru's Tetsujin 28 Go, recasts the giant robot as a symbol of Japanese military and industrial might, a last resort secret weapon built by the Empire to defend against American bombers. The toyetic influence is apparent in the way Tetsujin 28 is operated, by a remote control in the hands of a 12-year-old boy. It is this complex and contradictory legacy that is evoked by the image of Atomic Robot Man in the opening to 0080. Icon of nostalgia, of defeat, of childhood, of power, humiliation, destruction, exultant play, a weapon, a toy, a primitive and clumsy predecessor to their own work, part of a lineage inextricable from empire, war, conquest, and destruction, but also as a toy that delighted Japanese and American children alike just a few years after the end of the war between the two nations, it is a sign of how similar we can be, 
united in spirit, all of us saying, wow, cool robot. Next time on episode 5.5, Things Never Go Wrong, we research and discuss episode 4 of War in the Pocket and a strongly worded letter. Same face syndrome. Al sounds like a Gundam fan. The propaganda machine. First name basis. Even Garcia has a heart. Who wants to live forever? Professor X, but black. Weighted training clothes. And isn't this what you wanted? Can't you see that you are sweet? Mobile Suit Breakdown is written, recorded, and produced by us, Nina and Tom, in scenic New York City, within the ancestral and unceded land of the Lenape people, and made possible by listeners like you. The opening track is Wasp by Misha Dioxin. The closing music is Long Way Home by Spinning Ratio. The recap music is Pieces of Life by Analog by Nature. You can find links to the sources for our research, the music used in the episode, additional information about the Lenape people, and more in the show notes and on our website, GundamPodcast.com. You can get in touch with us on Twitter or Instagram at GundamPodcast, or by email to GundamPodcast at gmail.com. And thank you for listening. With the Omicron variant of COVID-19 currently surging in New York and around the world, I cannot in good conscience encourage you to share your wrong Gundam opinions, not even on deserted street corners. So stay home and mutter your wrong Gundam opinions to yourself or your most patient roommate, family member, pet, Gunpla model, or kitchen appliance. Maybe something like, Chris McKenzie can't be a Gundam pilot. She's well-adjusted and has a good relationship with her nice parents. We won't hear you, but that's for the best, isn't it? You like that? Yeah, it was cool. I told you it was a good ending. Sorry, friend. Who we know designs these things and knows that (laughs) playground merry-go-rounds are the worst. a lot of loud conversations outside yesterday. That must have been distracting. It was. Speaking of stereotypes, they gave Garcia a knife. Big scary knife. Yeah, was somewhat blown away when they're like, oh, she's gotten 30% better in some very short span of time, but it's not the 80% that we wanted. (laughs) Well, she's not a bakemono. Go on. (laughs) Blah, blah, blah. Older sisters, older brothers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Also, I cannot believe we missed the opportunity to say brother from another mother (laughs) in last week's Next Time Ons. Yeah. Truly a missed missed opportunity. I just love that Chris has given me the opportunity to use the word clobbered on this podcast.